uh, in Guyana and abroad to all talk with OGG in Guyana. We are on Kaiju Radio FM 91.1 in Essequibo and Demerara and FM 99.5 in Burbies. We are also live now on Facebook and YouTube. I would like to welcome the Guyanese in in the country and those abroad who are following us to today's show. The topic is Guyana's Natural Resource Fund overstated by 1.3 billion US dollars. Uh, to discuss this very important issue, we'll have a very special guest here. It's uh, Mr. Chris Ram. I would like to welcome him here. Uh, he's a chartered accountant and an attorney at law who heads the auditing company Ram and McRae in Georgetown. To many of the audience here in Guyana and abroad, he's well known as a prominent commentator of current affairs, particularly regarding the oil and gas industry in Guyana. His, uh, his articles appear regularly in the independent press. Uh, I'm talking about Fabric News and Kaichu News. And he also appears regularly in, in panel discussions. We've had him in the past already on Oil Talk, and he's a very distinguished guest. So it's wonderful to have him back here. Uh, my name is Andre Brandley. I'm going to be the host of today's show. Uh, I'm coming to you from Zurich. You can, those who are on Facebook and uh, on uh, YouTube can see uh, uh, in my background uh, Zurich and the lake. I teach at the University of Munich, and I'm a pro bono director for on the board of the oil and gas governance network in short OGGN. We are a non-profit organization registered in New York, uh, USA. Uh, we are non-partisan. Uh, we are uh, a group of Guyanese uh, academics, business people, engineers who are living either in Guyana or in the diaspora. And we advocate for good governance, transparency, accountability, uh, and international environmental standards uh, in Guyana's uh, oil and gas industry. <clears throat> we also uh, have been monitoring the oil contracts, and our aim is that Guyana has a fair uh, oil contracts that provide uh, sufficient return for the country for its developmental purposes. This means a fair share of oil revenue. We've come up in the past with uh, oil sharing models that, uh, oil profit sharing models that are simple and easy. Uh, we won't talk about this today, but our uh, key issue is advocacy uh, uh, on the behalf of the Guyanese people. In full disclosure, I'm not affiliated with any political party in Guyana, and I do not have any conflicts of interest, so I don't have any shares in oil companies that could bias uh, the statements that I would be making here. But my primary role is here to interview our guest, and this is Chris Ram. And <clears throat> I'm very much looking forward to this, to this talk. We would like to discuss uh, his most recent article, which was entitled Natural Resource Fund Overstated by 200, uh, 247, uh, 200,765 million turns into 1.3 billion US dollars. For simplicity, I'm going to keep it to US dollars. Also, for those Guyanese abroad can probably easily, more easily follow the numbers if we stay in US dollars and the Guyanese audience is very familiar dealing with the US currency. Now, this article appeared last Friday in December 29th in Starbrook News, and it has generated already quite some discussion. It is a part of a series of articles that Chris Ram has published under the series title, The Road to First Oil with Chris Ram. This is part 118, I've noticed, and this leads me to my first question. So before we delve into today's topics, I would like Chris Ram to tell the listeners of Oil Talk what motivated him to become a commentator of current affairs in Guyana, as evidenced by this series of articles. We are talking about the 118th article that appeared there. When did you write your first letter? Did you ever think of going into politics? Uh, Chris, this is to you. We're going to use first name basis here just to make things easier uh, for the audience. OGGN on our website. It's on W 
OGGN.org. That's our website. You can find our previous sessions and additional material explaining uh, the uh, objections of OGGN. We have all the information about the oil contracts. We have the, uh, the detailed Starbrook block oil contract you can find there. You can find also a lot of the letters that members of OGGN have published in the past. I see that Chris Ram is logging in again, so uh, he should appear again soon. Okay, Chris is back here. Good. So maybe a last point. If you like our show, please go on to YouTube and put your uh, indicate this with thumbs up. If you are on Facebook, you can put in your likes. And if you like the show today, uh, please place a comment. We always look at these comments and try to incorporate them in future shows. So now as Chris is back, did we lose you, Chris? You hear me, Chris? I'm hearing you, yes. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, so I gave the introduction. I think the audience heard that. Uh, I uh, got now back to your the actual topic of today's show, we're going to talk about your recent article entitled Natural Resource Fund Overstated by 274,765 million Guyanese dollars. And to make things simpler, I decided that we're going to use US dollars as the currency. Otherwise, we have these huge inflated numbers and Guyanese abroad might not to be too familiar anymore with these huge numbers. So uh, your uh, article stated that we have it's overstated by 1.3 billion us dollars and it's a matter of urgency this article appeared in starbrook news on friday december 29th this is last week and it's actually part of a series of articles that are entitled the road to first oil with chris ram so we have here 118 articles have been published this brings me to my first question and it's more on a personal uh, 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 more personal question uh, before we delve in the actual topic. Uh, I would like to know from you uh, what motivated you actually to become a commentator besides your very busy schedule as a uh, chartered accountant and an attorney at law uh, to become a commentator of current affairs in Guyana. When did you write your first letter? Did you ever think of going into politics, given your very detailed expertise in current affairs in Guyana? Maybe you can comment briefly on these points. I'm sure the audience will be interested in knowing more about you at on this level, besides uh, your frequent uh, appearance as a columnist in the independent news media of Guyana. Well, Back thank to you, you very much. Thanks to OGGN um, for for asking me again to to um, appear in the program. I, like you, I do not belong to a political party. I never have, of course. <laughs> the time wanders have, have um, a lean. That's the extent of it. Um, you asked me when I first, I, I, I remember I was in high school, and this was in the 60s, that is of the last century, for the wow. young people. I was pretty uh, young then in the 60s. <laughs> uh, you basically would define yourself as a critical citizen of this country and you think people should have a voice and should express their voice and not leave uh, political matters to the politicians, if I understand you correctly. Well, I, I, um, the word critical, I, I don't think I, I, I'm just about being critical. Um, is to offer my my own view or comment on on a particular topic. Okay, good. I mean, that's I think any nation with uh, with uh, citizens that take their community and the uh, development of the community serious should really get engaged in the political affairs and should also voice their opinions. I think that's. Uh, one of the major essence of a vibrant democracy. And I think we need people like you that express their opinions in public and also allow a political discourse. I think this is what distinguishes a, 
uh, a vibrant democracy from an autocracy where uh, in an autocracy, uh, the public is actually not expected to voice their opinions because people on top tell the public how the country should be run. And I think voices like yours are very important. And we, because both of us, we are not the youngest anymore. And we hope that pe uh, the advocacy of people like you will motivate also younger people to step into our footsteps uh, once we are no longer uh, vocal advocates. Um, that's, uh, I would like to move on to maybe one topic uh, of current affairs um, before we uh, then really get into your letter. Uh, what is definitely on people's mind is the declaration of Argyle and the aftermath. I would just like to recapitulate briefly. Uh, President Ali met the Venezuelan President Maduro in Argyle, which is in St. Vincent and the, the Grenadines, on December 14th. That's about uh, a little bit more than two weeks ago. Uh, the issue was to uh, calm down and issue the situation resulting from the non-binding referendum in Venezuela, which was approved in a, <clears throat> in a vote uh, November 26th. This means in last November. The referendum consists of several points. We won't go into the details, but essentially uh, the referendum calls for the establishment of a new state in Venezuela that would occupy, called Guyana Esequibo, that would occupy the uh, Guyana's Esequibo region. What is your take on this declaration? Is this a favorable de declaration? Does it help really to calm down the situation? Uh, uh, along the border in the northwest, how do you view uh, this declaration and uh, well, its impact? Well, I, th I think it, I think it did have some immediate um, impact. The, the 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 war drums went silent. Um, I think Guyana probably got the best that it could have hoped for. It didn't. It was not an ideal situation. Um, Venezuelan referendum is still in place. The instructions to the army and and all those things still there. But it was good to see that some some other leaders with some influence over President Maduro might have um, brought him to the table to meet with our own President Ali. And um, as I said, why we why we didn't get what we wanted. Uh, I, I think the, the the tensions have certainly decreased. So, for, in your opinion, what would have been the ideal outcome uh, of such a meeting? I mean, we have made the point that it was the first face-to-face -face meeting with Maduro uh, between Maduro and Ali, to my knowledge, uh, uh, definitely the first one since this referendum has been passed. So, what would have been the ideal outcome, in your opinion? Well, I would have liked to see the. Um, I would have liked to see the the results of the referendum. Uh, I would have liked to see the the the, the, the and, and, and all the, the the orders made by President Maduro withdrawn, um, given his own internal political Venezuela's political dynamics. That was probably asking too much. Um, and so the, the threat is still there. We, we, and he has said that he is not, um, he's, he doesn't accept the jurisdiction of the, um, of the International Court of Justice in this matter. Um, he preferred dialogue. We went the route of dialogue. It did have, have some short term benefits, but how it will play out in the long term, I think is a matter of conjecture. conjecture. Good. I mean, you are an attorney uh, at law. Did you feel that this declaration was carefully drafted? It, it seems to me that, you know, it was barely, you know, two weeks between the referendum and then uh, Maduro moving, uh, you know, basically announcing that he will table uh, uh, motions in the Venezuelan parliament to basically implement uh, the uh, provisions of 
the uh, referendum. This has, of course, not yet happened. So from that point of view, maybe it's kept on hold from now. Uh, but it seems to me uh, it might have been rather hastily done. And I would just like to point out the explicit reference to the Guyana Agreement, uh, the Geneva Agreement of 1966, which um, basically uh, seemed to me that that agreement, which led to the bilateral discussions between Venezuela and Guyana, that went on for almost 50 years and were basically then ended by the UN Secretary uh, General Secretary uh, deferring the whole issue to the International Court of Justice. Now, by signing this declaration, it seems to me that you went back again to a situation that actually had been resolved and had come to its natural end. Uh, was this really a wise move, or do I read this wrongly? And uh, since you are in Georgetown on the ground and I'm in Zurich, I might have a different interpretation from the other side of the Atlantic? Well, you know, I, I think it's a reasonable um, interpretation, uh, an inference you're drawing. But um, some peop people have described the Argyle um, Declaration as, as Geneva Mark II. In, in other words, we've, we've decided to continue talking. Um, but, you know, it's always said, um, Jaja is better than our war. So let's talk. Let's and and we we've achieved something. It is not ideal, um, but I believe that he, both parties are he especially because Guyana is not the aggressor in this in this border controversy. I think right. that point has to be made clear. We make no claims on Venezuela. Venezuela is making a claim on Guyana um, arising out of a very questionable um, issue of someone, uh, you know, uh, who, who, who left a note. Now, I'm not sure that, that Venezuela had any basis in law. But, you know, the problem is border issues are often not settled legally they go on and on they um they drag on for centuries and one hopes that that's that will be the outcome that it will be favorable the um the boundaries 1899 is established by the um the the the, the work done by the surveyors um would be would be upheld but um and as a guyanese i i i, I really want that to happen um, yes, I mean, I'm, on, I'm on your page with that too, that uh, Guyana needs stable borders. And to date, we have achieved this with Brazil. I think there is no uh, uh, contention about the borders with Brazil. And also with Suriname, we still have some issues open there. The maritime border has been settled, but the border in the Quarantine River is still open and the as you, you very well know, the uh, Suriname claims the New River Triangle <laughs> as theirs. Uh, yes, I would like. That's I, I do not want to keep this discussion, of course, and this is, of course, anyway, a pro uh, a situation is in pro uh, progress. We have seen the HMS Trent uh, 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 coming into Guyanese coastal waters and exercising with the Guyanese Coast Guard. And we've also seen already that uh, President Maduro calls this uh, uh, essentially a violation of the spirit of the declaration of, of Ar uh, Argyle. So we'll have to see how this is developing. And I do not want to make today's oil talk a, uh, uh, that this is the main topic. I would like to come now back to <laughs> the main topic, which is uh, your uh, recent article on the Natural Resource Fund to recapitulate uh, you have stated that it's overstated. We have uh, 1.3 billion US dollars. Uh, uh, it's overstated by 1.3 billion US dollars. And this is a matter of urgency. So it, uh, we're talking about the Natural Resource Fund. And I will start with a very simple question. Would you like to explain the purpose and primary objectives of the Natural Resource Fund? Why does Guyana need 
a uh, such a fund at all? Well, I, I think such a fund is associated with all countries that have significant revenues from non-renewable resources. What you're in fact doing is exploiting resources that will not be there for succeeding generations. So um, current generation is exploiting it, is converting the, the exploitation into revenues. And um, it would seem to be unfair to future generations to just um, for the current generation to get all the benefits. So a natural resource fund is a fund that is set up outside of the consolidated fund, the normal day-to-day -day, um, fund of the government uh, that, that is to provide for transformational long-term projects, to provide um, investments and, and, and income and, uh, and revenue from those investments for future generations. As you know, Saudi Arabia and, and, and Norway, they, they don't ever touch. They, they touch the only money that they spend is the revenue from the fund. And, and that's what, what an ideal situation is going to be. Dave and Guyana's deficit uh, of infrastructure, physical and human and social infrastructure, we will, it will take some time for us to get there. Um, partly because of that and partly because we have this, what everybody, I don't think there's anyone who would say that Guyana got a fair deal out of the 2016 agreement. So I think we're gonna, that, we might address we might address that later. So you said that uh, countries like Norway and <coughs> excuse me Saudi Arabia uh, use the revenue, but they don't really use the revenue. They use the interest gained on the revenue. Right? Is that correct? That they no, spend? no, 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 no. I, I regard interest as revenue. What? The, what? The, okay. It, good. The, the the money from the, the from their natural resources going to the, the sovereign wealth fund is is invested and it produces interest, it produces dividends and other forms of income. Okay, correct, correct. I just want to clarify that. So uh, this means that countries like Norway and Saudi Arabia do not really deplete the fund. <laughs> they basically keep the core of the fund, they increase the core of the fund and they spend uh, the interests, uh, the dividends, etc., that they gain on investing that money in the fund, that's what they really spend. That's correct. Right. That's correct, right, sir. Good. So now where is the Gu Guyana's uh, Natural Resource Fund, which, uh, you know, it's generically is a sovereign wealth fund. I think that's a term that yes, uh, is sort of a generic term. Uh, Guyana's Sovereign Wealth Fund is called the Natural Resource Fund. Uh, Norway calls actually its natural uh, sovereign wealth fund uh, tradition. It's the it's the pension fund, which is sort of interesting. I was told it's named pension fund because it uh, was purposely named pension fund because it should sensitize the politician that this is not really a piggy bank, but it's for future generations for pensions. That's why it was named pension fund. Yeah. In slang, it's still called the oil fund because it's fed by the oil revenues of oil and gas revenues of Norway. Now, where is Guyana's, uh, where is that account located of the natural resource fund? Well, the operational management falls with the, with the central bank. Um, because the fund Correct. is, is relatively, um, new. And, you know, we started with, with low levels of production. Production is ramping up as we move forward. Um, so the oh, money is asking not... It different. Sorry? Asking it the question. Asking the question differently. What is fed into the fund? What are the resources that go into the natural resource fund? Essentially, the monies that go to the natural resource fund would be the royalty and the, um, the share of profit oil. A um, share of profit, I correctly. Yes. And, I, I, as uh, in which, as you know, uh, as in you which know, currency is that denominated? Well, because the the investments are held in 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 the United States, it's, the investment is held in the United States dollars. Exactly. So the account is located, as far as I recall, 
at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. That's and, correct. Uh, all the oil revenue that Guyana basically has uh, given to contractors to sell goes into that fund in US dollars. Then we yeah. have the royalty payments of the Starbrook Block, <clears throat> uh, uh, Starbrook Block Consortium. That is what a two percent paid on the overall sales of all the oil extracted, I guess, per month or per year goes into that fund. That's two percent. And of course, that money sits now in, uh, in a federal reserve bank account in the US and it will accumulate interest. That's correct. And that also goes into the fund. That's correct. That goes also in the fund. And of course, these interest rate payments have been very low in the previous years, but uh, those people familiar with the interest rate hikes in the US know that the Federal Reserve interest rate is right now at 5.5%. And of yes. course, the uh, money, Guyana's oil revenues that sit in the Natural Reserve Fund will be uh, will get that uh, similar interest rate as long as the money remains there. Of course, once it's withdrawn, it won't generate any more interest rates. That's correct. correct. Good. Uh, I admire your your technical knowledge, your d details. Okay, well, um, I, I think you have to explain is. this to the public. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you are the expert. I'm just the person asking the questions. Yeah. Um, now, the Natural Resource Fund Act was initially passed by the coalition government, if I recall correctly, in 2018. Uh, while, it was 2019. Might have been 20. 20 was it oh, 2019? I, yeah, I think it was think 2018. So. Okay. Uh, it okay. was, I think, shortly after they lost the uh, vote of non confidence in Parliament. Now, this was changed in 2021 by the present incumbent administration. Uh, could you maybe explain to the public why it was changed and what were uh, maybe in the few sentences the key changes? Well, um, I think there were some significant changes. Um, the name remained the same, which even that was a bit Correct. of a surprise, given how, given how we operate in Guyana. Um, but the, the name Natural Resource Fund, of course, they, they, the previous governments, um, previous governments, NRF was repealed when the current um, NRF uh, was passed. I, I I think the one of the criticisms, certainly the the PPP supporters and, and, and members um, felt that they that they that the its predecessors NRF was a bit too complex. Um, the withdrawal mechanism, the um, and the the whole machinery. Um, the number of persons who were supposed to be participating in in, in the in the um in the oversight the, the governance uh, uh, the oversight and the governance it it was too complicated with too many of them let us simplify it um and they did have that effect the the NRF of the of the uh, new government had far more funds going in. To the fund than the than the um, PPP version of it. PPP version of it is largely a petroleum fund. Exactly. My, my, my question, of course, Guyana has other natural resources That's right. like uh, gold. It uh, has manganese. Uh, uh, deposits. It has bauxite. Uh, Forestry. We have we have lots. We have lots. But they do not. Do they also feed? The, uh, uh, the revenues made, do they go into the consolidated fund or do they go into the natural resource fund? They go into the consolidated fund. Well, via, okay. via, the, via the respective um, statutory bodies, the forestry, of course, is the um, forestry, the money goes to the um, forestry commission, etc. Um, the geology and mines commission, the gold board, the, these, these all are separate. Um, they, they are government bodies but they they control the funds and they, these are transferred to the government via the via the consolidated fund. 
Good. So uh, to summarize up, the Natural Resource Fund is Guyana's sovereign wealth fund. It's fed uh, in principally only by the oil revenue, royalty payments, and by interest gained on the money sitting in the account in New York. Yes. <laughs> now, how is this Natural Resource Fund governed? Uh, I know, for example, the Norwegian uh, National Resource uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund is completely separate from the government. It's managed by an investment committee that is not appointed by the government. It's appointed by parliament. All parties, the majority of the parties have to agree on it. Uh, they have a widespread mandate. These are experienced fund managers. Actually, one of the, the current president is a uh, extremely uh, successful hedge fund manager that actually sold his fund because he felt he wanted to give something back to his country and he's now running his fund for the last four years. It's completely separate from political interference. Uh, the Prime Minister of Norway uh, does not appoint any members. These are basically all uh, out of government control. The only thing that is decided on a regular basis is the withdrawal, how much percent they can withdraw from the fund, but there's no political interference. Now, how's the situation in Guyana? Is there a board of directors? Is there an investment committee? Uh, has there been an outsourcing in terms of the savings, how they are being managed? Or one could, for example, imagine that you say, uh, you put you tender put a tender out there for uh, asset managers, international experienced asset managers, to manage those savings. Uh, is there anything like this in place, to your knowledge? There is a board of directors. There is an investment committee within the board. There is a bank again that manages uh, operational management. But you know, all of these positions are um, are held by persons appointed by the government. It's, it's, it's one of the unfortunate features of governance in Guyana that just about every public body, whether regardless of how critical it is, um, is, is, is made up of persons, is constituted of persons who are appointed by the government of the day, whether it's the president, or maybe a subject minister in some cases. But um, so, um, the so this means it's also subject to political potential political interference. Um, not necessarily, but I think I, I, I think the reality is that the government tends not to appoint persons. Um, with whom it does not feel a sense of affinity and, and and some confidence that look these are not these persons are not going to go off and maybe um an escapade of their own and 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 um even though the government itself has not set clear policies of what it intends to do um and, and that's i say that not that the nrf um has shown any serious is issues of weaknesses, but the, the, the reality, these are all political appointees. Um, and okay. they, they, but they have not had, no investment manager has been, I don't think an investment manager has been appointed as yet. Um, there, there's a board, uh, there's an investment committee, <clears throat> but, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the amount of money is uh, in the fund is not, um, not particularly great. And, and, and the, the, the concern, the concern for, for for me in the article is that look, if you if you were to take this money out, I, I, as you ought to. Um, okay, we're going to we're gonna get back to that part. You you want to ask me about that? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're going to get back. It's going to. I mean, it, this it's going to have. It's going to have implications. Yes. Yeah. I uh, so I recall there is essentially not much money left currently in the fund because of course we have withdrawal rules. Uh, do, do, would you like to comment on the current withdrawal rules from the uh, Natural Resource Fund, or shall I summarize that up briefly? Well, it, it, you know, it's these tranches of $500 million, I think it is. Um, the first $500 Correct. million. 
um, go, go would be transferred to the to the um, consolidated fund. Of course, there are conditions as well. It's to be used. It's it's not to be used in, in perhaps in paying salaries. But you know, Professor. I well, we're going to we're going to come back to that in a moment. Yeah. So yeah. maybe just to make this uh, a short, uh, as you mentioned uh, rightly, the first five hundred million U.S. dollars are completely withdrawn. Then yeah, the next five hundred yeah. million is seventy five percent. Then again, the next one is fifty percent. Exactly. Until we get down to three percent. Yes, that's so, correct. That's correct. I think, uh, at least for me, this the one brilliant thing of this withdrawal rule is. <clears throat> that it goes into a natural cap because it basically does not go linear. It basically peters out. So the yes, max that you can withdraw, if I remember correctly, so will be about 1.3, 1.4 billion US dollars per year. And yes, that's everything correct. Everything that is left would be then your savings. And yes, uh, yes. as you rightly have mentioned, the savings are essentially small because you can withdraw initially a lot, but as the money accumulates, there should be more money in there. And you might recall that we had U.S. <clears throat> uh, asset managers visiting Guyana a few months ago. I think it was BlackRock. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was uh, uh, Solomon Brothers and some others were meeting with uh, the uh, finance minister, Ashley Singh, and with the vice president. And I recall the vice president telling uh, after the meeting that uh, they should more or less first show up in about 2030 again, because then there will be more money in the natural resource fund yeah. to be uh, managed. So maybe to close this part, I think we don't have to worry right now too much about managing the savings because we don't really have much savings left in the fund. They, of course, might rapidly accumulate as more uh, offshore oil production uh, boats are going online. And uh, we have the third one was just recently, earlier last, uh, late last year, went online. Ayara, and there are more to come. The current projections is that we should have 10 uh, floating uh, production, offloading and storage boats um, uh, off the coast of Guyana producing well over a billion barrels of oil per day. <clears throat> so that's a situation. Uh, what, now, what did you say, billion? You meant million. A million barrels of oil per day. Million barrels per day, yes, correct. Okay, yes, okay. thank you for correcting that. Yeah. Of course, that will end up to be, uh, sev uh, <clears throat> will be several billion, uh, several hundred billions per day, of course, uh, per year then. Uh, no, 300, 300 million per year. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, now, what's the role of the parliament, actually, with regard to the NRF? Does it have any oversight? The legislation, it, my recollection is the legislation does not provide um, particular guardrails in relation to parliamentary oversight. And, you know, the way our parliament operates is um, the, the ruling party, whether it's a one-seat majority, two-seats or whatever, makes the rules and Legislation is just passed without any serious and meaningful debate in our country, and that's a real tragedy. Yes, I, uh, you recall that, you know, at least uh, from my perspective, the NRF uh, Act is, in my modest opinion, one of the most important laws that will govern the future of Guyana with regard to its financial security. And I was uh, stunned to see that there was no proper uh, consultation across all stakeholders, and there was no proper uh, debate. Typically, in mature democracies, these laws go into parliament, and point by point is discussed. The opposition might put in motions. There will be votes on it. There might be changes to it, and uh, they might go to select committees to basically work on this to find compromises. but. Uh, maybe a last point with regard to legislation. Do you think changes in important laws like the Natural Resource Act should require a two-thirds majority in Parliament? Fact is that in Guyana, uh, you know, the last governments typically had maybe one or two 
uh, seats of majority in Parliament, so this very slim majorities, and uh, maybe by having rules like important laws need a two-thirds majority will force both sides to come to a compromise, and uh, that would accommodate more shareholders, uh, stakeholders in the country. Um, of course, in Switzerland, we have, where I'm uh, located as a Guyanese, there is a always a possibility that you can have a referendum and it will go to a public vote. So that corrects essentially for uh, one party pushing things through that might not be in the interest of the broader population. So uh, to keep this short, do you think we should have a two-thirds majority or would this be too restrictive and lead to uh, stalemates in Parliament? Given the importance of the Sovereign Wealth Fund, the National, uh, National Resource Fund, I would have even liked to see that entrenched in the Constitution as one of the entrenched clauses. So I would take it further than what you're suggesting, Professor. So if it's in the Constitution, changes of the Constitution require, uh, what does this require, a two-thirds well, majority in Parliament? Or it requires there are different levels of, of entrenchment in the Constitution. Um, there are some sections of the Constitution that requires a simple majority, others that require a two-thirds majority, um, others that require um, a referendum, which is why you know the name of this con the, the country, the Cooperative Republic of Ghana, always been changed to Ghana. Um, it, it still is there in the Constitution, and therefore that mm -hmm. has, until we have a referendum in that uh, it, it remains so. Yeah. I, I okay. Prefer, so I'd like to see. I'd like to see um, it as a constitutional requirement. But I, I, I think a two thirds of of, um, of parliamentary vote would would be a reasonably adequate substitute. Okay, I'm on board with you about that because I think these laws are too important, and they should not be subject to you know, changes based on uh, short-term political interests. For example, I could imagine that the uh, withdrawal rules could be rapidly changed if a government gets too accustomed to spending money and they might uh, change the withdrawal rules, which are currently, I have to really say, are very reasonable and make sense. Uh, of course, in the whole... Uh, projection of how the oil and gas sector should develop until the end of this decade. Again, quick to the listeners, if you like what you see hearing here, please go on to YouTube or Facebook and indicate your uh, preference and your interest. You can also leave comments. And I would like to come now to the next point that I would like to discuss with our expert here, uh, Mr. Chris Ram. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, chartered accountant and attorney at law. And this is uh, the question of what are the provisions to what can you use the money that has accumulated in the National Resource Fund? Can you spend it on whatever you want? Or are there specific regulations for what this money can be used? Because we have, of course, the... Uh, <clears throat> the consolidated fund that is fed by the tax revenues and by duties, excise taxes, and so on, that is there to pay for the normal operations of the government. I mean, that is, was, of course, in place since independence, and that's the major uh, piggy bank of the country to run its duties towards its citizens. So what are the provisions for the NRF that the public... Uh, Get, uh, can hear this also from you? Well, it, it is mainly, um, or I, th I think the word used in the, in the, um, in the act was transformational projects um, and it's major, um, major infrastructural works. But you know, this business of it being used for this purpose, as you know, money is fungible. And once it, once it gets into the pot, it means that all that happens is that it frees up other money. This goes there. So um, we, you, can, you can still get bad accounting, accountability, um, and governance. Uh, and, and quite frankly, unless you have really good um, self-imposed practically uh, governance measures, where 
you almost say it in the budget, you divide the budget by streams. And this is for the the um the for money out of the NRF. This is this is for money um the consolidated fund. And you you manage you you, you manage them separately um so that you don't because the funds eventually the funds are commingled. No matter what you do, as I said, funds are funds are fungible. So you rightly so said that that uh, there are essentially uh, the funds that are accumulating the natural resource fund, and they can be withdrawn with the formula that we discussed a little bit earlier. Uh, they should go to projects of national importance, and if I recall correctly, also in case of. A, a natural emergency. Yes, yes, so if you yes, have yes, major definitely. flooding or if we were to be hit by a hurricane, fortunately Guyana almost never gets hit by hurricanes or by strong storms uh, or by, you know, maybe huge fires. Uh, oh. You can imagine in the future if, you know, parts of Georgetown were to burn down or something like that, <laughs> then that money could be activated. Now, of course, oh. of course, and that's, 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 uh, additional, that's additional money. Yes. That uh, uh, that's where you could use the money from the natural resource fund. Now, yes, if yes. it's for national, uh, if it's for specific projects, would you expect that at the beginning of the year that the government would have to outline and specify what are these projects of national importance? Uh, to my knowledge, I have never seen a list uh, that they specifically say, let's say, uh, the road from Georgetown to Lethem is a project of national importance and we're going to put money in there. Uh, are you aware of such a list of projects of natural importance, national well, importance that, uh, that are to be funded by the NRF? Or uh, do we have a situation where the money ends up in the consolidated fund and it just increases the consolidated fund? Uh, as you might recall, the natural budget of Guyana under the coalition government was in US dollars about 1.3 billion US dollars, I think, in 2019. And this year, the budget no, no, is. No, we, we, did, we, didn't we didn't have any flows in 2019. Remember, production only started Correct. late in 2019. No, no, no. I, 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 I'm aware of that. But the national budget was 1.3 billion. Oh, the national budget, US yes, dollars. that's right. Yes, exactly. That's right. And the, the national budget as of this year, I think, is well over the 3 billion US dollars. And of course, it has been fed by money from the NRF, correct? Partly by money from the NRF, that's correct. Good. Uh, <clears throat> so my question was, did you see a list of these national priority projects? Just to well, yes or no? You see, the, the minister refers to them. He, he talks about the projects, transformational projects. But these are, these are transformational projects that even before the, the NRF funds. And which is why I'm suggesting that ideally I would have liked to see. So, you know, you have a contingency fund, you have a deposit fund, um, you have a consolidated fund. Why not have um, a, a specific element in the annual budget? That's, that addresses and addresses only NRF finance projects. That exactly. Would be, I mean, that's that that's, would be a, that's exactly my question because that also allows you then that to be in line as far as I interpret this, and I'm not a, an attorney or a lawyer, that if you have a provision in the act that says the money has to be used to projects of national priority that the government would table at the beginning of the year this list in Parliament. It would be open for discussion and deliberation. <clears throat> the uh, opposition could put in maybe their objections that they think that this and that project is not doesn't fit the bill, and you would basically have a vote on this list at the beginning of the year, and then the money would be flowing into these projects that have been approved by the Parliament. Right. Wouldn't yes. this be a transparent money way of managing it? I, I think I think especially if you take an accountant's view of how to how it, it ought to be dealt with, it should be treated separately. Yes. Good. So this is enough of.
just talking about the sovereign wealth fund, its purpose, how it's managed, what the uh, how the money should be spent. We talked about also about the limitations, the limitations that we don't have at present a lot of savings. And as you pointed out uh, uh, rightly, the purpose is not only just to have money to spend uh, presently, but also to save money. Yes. Now yes. coming to your letter. And uh, I would like to reserve the remaining time that we talk now in detail about your letter. So you state that there's a specific accounting issue that led to an overstatement of the natural resource fund budget uh, from uh, 2.75 billion Guyanese dollars or 1.3 billion US dollars. Could you explain your findings to the general audience in a few sentences? Okay, um, I, I think your audience is, is aware of the of the 2016 <clears throat> Petroleum Agreement, um, in which Article 15 says the government shall pay the taxes owing by the by the oil companies, and it also says that the the money to pay those taxes come from government share of profit oil. Now, where is profit oil? Where is government's revenue from profit oil? Where does it end up? It ends up in the Natural Resource Fund. So you have to go right. to the Natural Resource Fund. Otherwise, then then, they, then there's no money to pay. It's the only place I, I, I should say that the Attorney General does not um, agree with me. I, he said it's illegal to use it. Well, one of the questions I posed to the Attorney General, tell me where the money will come from. Because they, they, so, they, so to these are one of the... Go on. So to restate, uh, the government of Guyana pays the taxes for Exxon and its partners. Yes, sir. And those, and those taxes have to be taken out of Guyana's share of the oil revenue. And the, the and... oil revenue is deposited... <laughs> To the natural resource in the, fund. In the natural resource fund. And your analysis of the balance sheets of the natural resource funds indicate that no money was withdrawn to pay, uh, to, uh, uh, to basically account for those taxes that should show up at some point in the consolidated fund. It should probably go first to the Guyana Revenue Agency. And they should then put it into the consolidated fund. Is that correct? Yes, it comes from the um, from the natural resource fund into the consolidate into the Ghana Revenue Authority, and periodically the Ghana Revenue Authority um, transfers it to the Ministry of Finance to be deposited in the consolidated fund. That's it. Okay, and uh, you've looked at the uh, annual report of the NRF and you can't find no evidence that that money was transferred. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. And um, I have independently confirmed it as well. Now, you write the number is 1.3 billion US dollars. Uh, how did you come up with that number? You and take... Over, over Sorry, how, uh, what's... Uh, and uh, does this is this this one point three billion? Is this uh, a number that goes also for twenty twenty three years, or is that for the first three years from twenty twenty to twenty twenty two? This is cumulative. Mm. That's correct. That's correct. And what I what I said it was actually up to <coughs> the um the period in twenty twenty June twenty twenty three by which time taxes ought to have been paid for the oil companies so that they could they could get a certificate of taxes paid to present to their home country to say, look, I've paid these taxes. I must now get credit in my global tax return. So it is a cumulative, it's a cumulative figure. Exactly. But uh, where did you find these numbers? that come up uh, is, uh, since it's not paid, the taxes have not been withdrawn out of the NRF. Yes. How do we know that this number is 1.3 billion US dollars? This, these numbers come from the audited financial statements of the oil companies. On the so they basically, 
they cover basically up to 2022. Is that correct? Right. The year 2022, but the taxes for 2022 would have to be paid sometime in 2023. So I've taken those figures into account as well. Now, are these audit reports public already? Or are these they audit are reports that you... <clears throat> That's correct. They are, audit, they, audit. They are they are filed with the commercial registry, yes. And... um. In, in terms of the balances on the natural resource fund, you, you see um, in, in, in my article, we, we identify the source of the information in relation to contractors' income statement contained okay. in their audited financials. And in relation to the, to the natural resource fund, we, our source was the quarterly reports of the Bank of Guyana, as supported by the audited financial statements of the Natural Resource Fund. And of course, of the statements that were provided by the Guyanese subsidiaries of Exxon, Hess and Sinuk. That's correct. That's correct, sir. I just want to make this straight because we have this whole issue about the expenses and the auditing of those expenses. We should keep this separate, not to confuse the public. That's correct. But Good. but but uh, I, I do believe I, I do believe that this ought to be part of the audit of petroleum operations. I don't sure. I think that I think the audits done well the the IHS audit would not have covered a revenue generating period. But the more recent audits and there's nothing to indicate that any um how the income was allocated, or how the revenue was accounted for. But the most recent audit, of course, goes back, I think it's from 2017 to, 2020, 20. 2017 to 2020. So the That's period right. that you're looking at is, has not even been yet. To my knowledge, the government has not even uh, uh, assigned an auditor for those years from 2020 to 2022. Well, well 2021, because 2020... 2020 was an income earning year and taxes yes, correct would become it. payable in 2021 which is which is the Good. assumption we made we we did we didn't put taxes as payable in 2020 but we felt taxes were payable in the first quarter of 2021 in respect of 2020 so what's the corporate tax rate that uh has Exxon and Sinuk should be paying, uh, or what's the corporate tax rate that was used to uh, generate these tax certificates? Do you they, have they cover, any specifics? Well, the, the, the corporate tax rates in Guyana are, are set by, by tax laws. And the, the, sure. the, tax, the tax rates are now, the tax rate for, for, for these types of companies is 25%. Of course, if the government raised, if at any time the rate of tax was raised, the government would have to compensate the oil companies for any um, disadvantageous situation we see about. That, that comes out okay, of the we, clause. We're going to get back to that a little bit later. So you believe that the tax rate is 25% that was used by the government uh, uh, that tax rate was used as a basis to uh, to issue these tax certificates. H are these tax certificates public knowledge, or are they are they available to the public? Has the government ever released them, or can we find them in the, uh, the annual reports of S of Exxon? Are they listed there? You know, I have a discussion with the Attorney General. Um, Mr. Anil Nandalal, senior counsel, and it's one of the questions I've raised. Um, That's your yes. That was part of your letter that was published yesterday in Kaiju News and Starbrook uh, News. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Good. Um, so I think it was published so the day before yesterday. I believe it was the day before yesterday. No? Okay, yes. but uh, this week essentially, yeah. Yes. So to summarize out the. 
receipts of taxes paid issued by the government of Guyana at present are not public. And uh, we can, in a way, a little bit deduce them from what the local companies have put into their reports to the Bank of Guyana. Not to the bank, in, in, in their audit reports, in their audit In their audit system. reports, yeah, yeah, which they have to uh, hand in uh, to the uh, Bank of Guyana, if I understood no, you they, correctly. They, no, 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 they, they hand it, they file with the Guyana Revenue Authority and they, they lodge um, as a matter of public record with the commercial registry. Okay, good, good. Thank you for correcting that. <clears throat> uh, the question arises for me, what's the purpose of issuing tax paid receipts to Exxon and Hess and Sinuk if neither of these oil companies actually are remitting corporate taxes to Guyana. I came across an interesting explanation by a commentator that was responding to your initial letter. Uh, why is it necessary for the government of Guyana to issue these tax certificates? And he says, in quote, of note, the purpose of the minister filing the tax return, which is some equivalent to the tax assessed on the contractor's behalf, is merely to accommodate Exxon Mobil, the operator, and uh, uh, he doesn't write this here, in satisfying their statutory rep reporting requirements in accordance with the US tax laws. Would you like to comment on this? So basically, right. Guyana uh, files tax receipts indicating that actually Exxon has paid taxes, but they actually never paid the taxes they, because it, it, the production it's... sharing agreement, uh, the production sharing agreement states that Guyana has to pay it. That's, that's correct. Whilst the company is liable, 15.3 of the agreement says the government is liable, the all companies are liable, 15.4 says the money will be paid by the government of Guyana. But, um, I think it's an extremely simplistic and a dangerous. Um, I, I, I don't need, I wouldn't ask you to, to, to say it a name, but that's extremely dangerous. But you know, um, Exxon has a lot of cheerleaders and supporters. Um, and one wonders how could, could Guyanese defend something like this, which if you get a receipt for something you didn't pay, that's that's an artifice. That's a that's a, a provision. Is and and you present it to your tax authorities in your home country. That that's almost fraudulent. Almost fraudulent. Yeah, sh you shouldn't, didn't this, pay. shouldn't this shouldn't this be illegal? I mean, have you have you had a, a look uh, whether the IRS? which is the uh, internal revenue service in the U.S., it fulfills the similar uh, role like the GRA in Guyana. Uh, are they aware of the fact that Exxon presents tax certificates for taxes they never paid? To me, it sounds, as you mentioned, this is, uh, this is sort of fraud, what they're doing, because they're going to get a tax credit in the U.S., for a uh, activity or for a uh, measure that they never really did themselves. If anything, that, the tax credit should go back to the Guyanese people, right? Or to the government of Guyana. Absolutely. I mean, if, if it's not illegal, it certainly is improper. And, you know, when, when something is improper. And I don't know I don't know how this meshes in with the, um, the G20 decision that every company that earns more than a billion dollars must pay at least 15% tax or something like that. I mean... They, but but they do it and they get away with it. And as I, I said, actually, thank you for raising that point about the fifteen percent minimal taxes for large corporation. Uh, you might recall I had written a letter in uh, did. end you of did. April this year, pointing out that only two countries that are CARICOM members have not signed that OECD guideline that corporate taxes of large companies should be a minimum of 15%. And uh, Guyana has not signed that agreement and Suriname, the two major oil producers yeah, in uh, in the Caribbean region at this point, uh, have not signed it. Interesting enough, Trinidad has signed it, but they, they are taxing, of course, their oil companies. So they can sign yeah. this without uh, any hesitation. 
to That's make right. things worse, and I think I pointed this out in the article, but the, gov- the, the Guyanese public is not aware. If Guyana doesn't raise this 15% on uh, Exxon and its partners, the home countries can raise this 15%. And this has led in Switzerland uh, to a vote where we had to increase our corporate tax rate to a minimum of 15%. Otherwise, uh, uh, other countries could collect what Switzerland has not been uh, raising from companies operating, the multinational companies operating in Switzerland. Interestingly enough, I never got any response. Uh, the Minister of Finance never reported. Maybe I should uh, repost that letter and ask specifically Ashni Singh for a response. What the reasons are, what's the argumentation that Guyana has to date not signed that agreement? Um, yeah, you, you know, maybe you know on. So yeah. we are subsidizing the. Um the Treasury of the United States of America, incredibly. But no, in no one seems you're to, right. nobody seems to care. Uh, un, unfortunately, the debate, and if the, the learned Attorney General uh, and, and, and you got a Vice I President... Will just get, I will just get back to him. Uh, so, in summary, you are saying that the Natural Resource Fund has actually too much money in there right now? because the taxes that we've paid for, that we've certified to have paid on behalf of Exxon and its partners have not been withdrawn from that. So who bears the responsibility for this omission? Is it the Ministry of Natural Resources? Is this the Ministry of Finance? The GRA, should they have pointed it out? We have the vice president that oversees the whole oil sector and the buck at the end stops with the president because he as president is uh, 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 above the vice president and if he had noticed this shouldn't he have pointed this out well you know they're relying on a flawed law to say that that law is supreme but I, I differ with you a little bit on, on this score professor because I think the the obligation is on the directors of the of the fund to okay. um, to ensure that they present to the auditors proper financial statements, and it is the obligation of the auditors to make sure that those financial statements accurately reflect the state of the funds and and the flows of the fund. Now, in my view, who are the auditors? Who are the auditors the, in this case? The, the state audit. The Auditor General. So this says the no. GRA should do the audit. No, I, I don't. That's not the role of the GRA at all. The GRA is to administer the tax laws of the country. But they also do auditing, right? Well, they ought to do their own auditing. I've never been in favor. I've, I've always objected to the GRA being considered the, the ultimate auditors. And when we are told, oh, the, the GRA has the final say, no, the GRA is very different is to see whether or not the financial statements have been prepared according to income tax laws. That's what Section 16 of the Income Tax Act has applied to the Corporation Tax Act says. So now, you said this is bad governance the way it's run right now. Yeah, it, it is. And what I believe ought to have happened, um, since it wasn't paid, I think a provision should have been made. And if the, if the, if the, the directors of the NRF did not want to do it, the auditors should have qualified their opinion. But this is a liability of the Natural Resource Fund. It is not a contingent liability. Contingent is an, it is an uncertainty and you make a provision. But this is an actual liability that um, the only thing it has not been, by omission, it has not been recognized. Now you've raised this issue uh, last Friday that we have this problem that taxes that... Uh, Guyana has certified to have paid on behalf of the oil companies have not transfer been transferred to the uh, GRA. Has there been any response from the well, government? Well, the the Attorney General on his Facebook page has responded. Um, he has not named could me. You, could you summarize he, briefly what his response was? His response was, well, this is not provided for in the natural resource fund. My contention... Um, Andre, is that my correct? Contention, 
my contention is that um that there was a disconnect between the the NRF and the agreement. But the, the agreement of legislation takes supremacy. But in any case, and then he talks about, uh, you know, and I pointed out a case in which he himself appeared and a case that, that all of us as lawyers, he's senior, I'm junior. But we, we know some cases that said, look, a government must honor contractual obligations and it can't hide behind sovereign immunity. Mm -hmm, as, mm -hmm. as a cloak to not um, comply with its obligations. What so, I've done, what I've done, um, Andre, is I've put some very specific questions to the Attorney General. I've I've asked him, for example, the first question I asked. Yeah, is, so you had is, ten is, page, you had ten questions that you asked in response to his Facebook page. Maybe yeah. just briefly, was there some other responses? Did the Minister of Finance voice his opinion? Did the Vice President voice his opinion? These people, no. these are the three people I would expect: the Attorney General, the the no. Minister of Finance, uh, the Minister of Natural Resources, so potentially none, two, none, and none, none, the Vice none. President. So none of those. Just to make the record straight, so far the only response we have is the post of. The Attorney General on his personal, is this a personal Facebook page or is this a uh, government Facebook page or a ministry Facebook page? I, I think this is, I, I'm not sure, I, I, which is why I sought clarification. Please tell me whether this is your, whether this is your, the government's position or is your personal views. And, I, I, you know, okay. I really do believe, I, I cannot see how that question can go unanswered because it leaves the entire country. It leaves, uh, as you call it, the NRF is probably the most important, is, is as, as important as the Consolidated Fund. And you, you were treated in such a cavalier and casual manner. No, it's, it's, it's just not acceptable. So the only evidence right now of a response is what, he pay, uh, what the Attorney General put on the fa his Facebook page. And he basically says that the natural resource uh fund act of 2021 overrides anything that might be in conflict with the with previous uh agreements like the starbrook block production sharing agreement you know one of the other questions i asked do the oil companies believe that as well and has he discussed that with you has he discussed his interpretation with the oil companies but you know have you heard um, have you got I, a I response have... actually from the oil companies uh, sorry well, for interrupting you. Happy to be. You know, it, I I thought and I I thought the press should be should have taken up those questions. Um, mm. I I, I don't mean it's early it, yeah. it's early days of course. You know your letter was published. Uh, uh, we have now Friday in Switzerland, so it was published a week ago, and it's still sort of vacation period in a way. I guess we'll have to see how things develop over the next few days. Um, you mentioned that the NRF law has uh, not really, uh, or the people, or the uh, the commission, uh, which was, of course, uh, put in place by the uh, ruling government that uh, rewrote the NRF Act uh, in 2021, had overseen the fact that taxes should also be uh, one should be able to withdraw taxes from the National Resource Fund. Uh, do you believe that this could have been avoided if the National Resource Act would have been really put into uh, uh, a, a real consultation period, if it would have been sent to a select committee? Would that have been obvious to the opposition that there is a disconnect between the Natural Resource Fund Act and the Starbrook Block Agreement, which is the only operational uh, uh, production sharing agreement in the oil sector at present. You know, you, you know, Andre, it's 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 very disappointing that the previous government, which signed the 2016 agreement, did not put that in their version of the NRF Act. So it was missing there already. Yes, I spoke to the I spoke to the former finance minister. He admits that that was an omission. Did he do so, this? 
did he come out with a public statement on I, this? No, he didn't. And, I, you know, that's the problem with our country, Jeff. That's the problem. Now, I all, if you notice, a couple months ago, the IMF all re, also looked at this at this um, NRF. The IDB has looked at it. You mean nobody has seen this? It's, it's quite incredible. It, it, it really speaks poorly of our country. And, and what has exacerbated that, what has aggravated that situation is our, our Attorney General, who is a man of considerability, legal and otherwise. He is defending such a situation. That's the tragedy. I think a first step forward would be definitely, uh, and it would be very helpful also for the public, if the opposition and the former finance minister comes out with a statement along the lines that you have been told in private. I'm not sure if this was done in confidence or not. I don't want to compromise anybody. But I think the opposition should also really come out and uh, uh, voice their opinion on this issue. And I think, you know... The strengths of democracies is that mistakes can be recognized and they can be fixed. And that's how democracies function and vibrant democracies do that. So you know, obviously we won't be able to solve everything today. We have to wrap it up. We went already a few minutes over the projected time. Yes, you have. Uh, exactly. Uh, but, I just, uh, but I have to say we got through all our questions that I had compiled here. I think we're going to wait your 10-point uh, uh, catalog of questions that you made public in uh, your uh, article, in your letters, follow-up letters in Kaichu News and Starbrook News. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I would say, a situation that is developing. You've basically rolled the first stone, and let's hope that this issue will be resolved. And... Uh, do you expect to get an answer actually from the Attorney General? So far, he's been silent since uh, his Facebook uh, post. Uh, can we expect uh, a public uh, response? Will there be maybe a commission of inquiry to look at this? Uh, uh, is this the way that things will be going? Or how, what do you project will happen? Or will one just sort of sit out and yep. uh, basically try to sweep things under the carpet and ignore uh, this important issue you have raised in your um, in, in your letter of uh, uh, Friday, December 29th. You know, I, I have um, I've been calling for commission of inquiry, particularly Trotman's book make it so so clear that we needed a commission of inquiry. This here, this is this is a simple accounting issue. You don't need, you don't need a, an account, um, a commission of inquiry to fix this. There has been an omission, and you need to address it. What's the problem? Um, I I know the Attorney General. I like the Attorney General. I work with the Attorney General. Um, I, I, as I said in my letter, he's committed to constructive dialogue and that he too will recognize um, that, look, answer these questions and, and let's see where the problem really lies. Good. So now if one would rectify this by allowing that the uh, those taxes can be withdrawn from the NRF, which is <laughs> Uh, that present state is uh, illegal. What are the consequences? Wouldn't the uh, natural resource fund be even more depleted uh, below the actual withdrawal rules? Because you would have a separate mechanism to withdraw additional money from the NRF, basically well, the amount of the taxes paid. So this would leave essentially no savings, right? Well, is that correct? But but the longer the longer we take to fix this problem, the greater the problem is going to become. Yeah, I mean, um, one thing is just one thing is, of course, you know, a a, a problem on a uh, you know a, a mechanistic uh, level, but there are also, of course, consequences uh, for the savings because, of course, uh, if you say you pay taxes for somebody else, that those taxes have to end up in the treasury and uh, become available to be spent. And of course, where uh, the, pot of, uh, the pot where you took the money will have less money in there, which will still leave the problem of 
that Guyana pays taxes on behalf of the oil companies has not been rectified. We still have that issue remaining. You know, yeah, and, and we have, we've had precedent in this country where we will we change tax laws, particularly with, with this government. You know, they, I mean, you, you could deem something as having been paid. Um, how you deal with the GRA, but fit, get your people with knowledge, experience, and expertise to address the problem and fix the law so the agreement is consistent. Because Mr. Nandalal's suggestion that the agreement is now out of the window means all the stability clause, all the obligations of the government of Vienna to do these things no longer apply. That cannot be so right. Means... Right. So I think we're going to leave it with this question. And I hope we get you back once we get a response from the government. <coughs> Would you be happy to talk with us again uh, once we get a specific response from the government? addressing uh, the question, uh, the very important question you have raised. I I am always willing to talk once it's convenient. And so I think I, I have some kind of um, opinion and valid opinion on it. I'll be willing to talk. And since I raised the questions, more specifically, I, I raised the questions, then I, I, I should be willing to take it further. Is there something we have not covered in this first interview on this topic? That you well, I, want I, I, to... I think, um, but we, we covered it a, a, a moment ago. This business does this agreement. Does this agreement stand? Um, the the attorney general seems to think that um, it, the tax provisions no longer stand. He needs to say whether there are other provisions that also no longer stand. And and did the NRF constitute um, uh, by implication amendment? of the 2016 agreement. So, so that's a very good point that I think you've laid out in detail in your recent letter, follow-up letter, those 10 questions. And if it happens that the Attorney General answers these questions one by one, I think we have a good basis for the next interview with you. I would like to thank you for your patience and your time. We went into, <coughs> covered a lot of ground here. With regard to the NRF, I think uh, I hope that the general public got an idea why we have the NRF, what are the issues of uh, or the consequences of the Guyanese government paying taxes for Exxon, and I hope that in future discussions we can go in further detail. Uh, I believe there are also other issues that, of course, the fact that Exxon is not paying taxes means, for example, that. Exxon does not have to use U.S. dollars to pay their, actually, the corporate taxes, which means they would have to go to the Bank of Guyana, change U.S. dollars into Guyanese dollars to pay their tax duties if they were really subject to the 15 or 25 percent corporate taxes, which means that the Bank of Guyana would massively increase its foreign currency yeah, because uh, if you pay taxes locally, you have to bring in U.S. dollars to pay those taxes. And this yes. might be another issue that needs to be discussed in the future. So we went 15 minutes over the the uh, agreed time. I thank you for your patience. We went over time in interest of the audience because we started very basic and we ended up with uh, the reasons for the issue that you raised that basically... Taxes have not been withdrawn from the Natural Resource Fund. They should actually end up in the Consolidated Fund. And uh, this issue remains unresolved. And we are waiting to see what the response will be of the government of Guyana uh, with regard to this issue. And as soon as we have a response, we try to schedule a follow-up talk with you, either with me as a host or with our uh, usual host with Charles Sugrim. I just got a one response uh, from a listener, and it says this was a great interview, and the, I think this uh, thank you goes to you and not to me. Thank you for your patience and uh, uh, answering all my questions to the best of your knowledge. Have a wonderful evening, and I'm looking back to have you again on Oil Talk in the future. I want to thank you on behalf of the Board of Directors of OGGN, and I also would like to thank the audience for all of those who have held out for this 
rather extended interview with Chris Ram, one of the uh, experts in uh, current affairs in Guyana, particularly regarding the oil and gas industry. I would also like to uh, encourage you to read his frequent contributions to the Guyanese press. Uh, I mentioned that he had this 118. There are more to come, and I'm glad that he writes again more frequently these columns in Starbrook News, primarily. Thank you very much, and we're going to close the show now at quarter to uh, nine Guyanese time, quarter to two uh, Central European time, and I'm looking forward to be back again with you and uh, with other distinguished guests on our show. All talk with OGGN Guyana. If you like the show, please indicate this on Facebook and YouTube, and you can see the recordings of this show in case you missed the beginning or you uh, didn't have time to finish uh, with this to the end. The recordings will be available on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, Facebook will be the Kai Chua Radio uh, Facebook site, and OGGN webpage will also have links to these, this show. Thank you again, Chris Ram. Wonderful talking to you and getting clear answers to hopefully clear questions. They were clear. Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you and and the viewers and OGGN. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.